Welcome to the We Are Film Podcast with your hosts, Cameron Gallagher and Zach Pouye. So yeah, I appreciate you taking the time to, to chat with me. I, uh, I know we've been chatting over the years about shot lists and I never got a chance to actually sit down and, you know, kind of ask you some questions and especially about, you know, some of the, the awesome work you've done and, and the stuff you've gotten to accomplish, which obviously is sweet and obviously a little bit about shot lister, which I do love. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm excited for it. So I guess one of the biggest things I really wanted to talk about today in general was really just, uh, especially with freaks, you know, the idea of film festivals and the, the distribution end, and obviously, uh, you know, this is a, I don't want to say a lower budget, but yeah, you know, a lower budget, especially compared to some of the other it stuff that you've done pretty, too. Pretty low budget. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. So like, you know, I, I guess how does a project like that even come about to begin with, or just, just kind of start? Yeah. Um, you know, I made the film with uh, my best friend and he and I were both directors that had sort of, were lucky enough to start getting directing work for hire that sort of lower budget things where people were paying us to direct, but it wasn't the type of work we really wanted to be doing. It wasn't that rewarding of work. You know, we knew we had stories in, in ourselves that we could tell, but every time we wrote scripts, every time we got attached to scripts we liked, they just never happened. You know, anyone <laughs> who's listening, you have that sort of catch 22 of you need the money to get the actor and the actor to get the money and then to get the bond to get the, you know, just like it always falls apart um, and the movie never gets made. And we saw this speech um, by Mark Duplass online called The Cavalry's Not Coming. It's like a really famous speech that he gave at South by Southwest. And he basically lays out how to have a career and the mistakes that every filmmaker makes. And the first thing that he said, which really struck home to us was, um, everyone writes a script they can't make and they need someone else to green light for them. And what we realized is if you, um, if you write a script with just the things that you already have, like we've got a house, we've got a restaurant, we've got your son, <laughs> like, like literally just, we've, we've got the two of us, like literally just the ingredients that you already have right now. Then technically, as soon as you're done writing that script, you can pick up a 5D or whatever and just start yeah. filming it. You don't need anyone else's permission to make that movie. If all the only things in the movie are things you already have. Um, and that was really freeing to us. So we went on a long walk and we went, okay, well, what are the things we already have? And that, those were the ingredients. And so we wrote a script literally about two guys, a kid, a house and a restaurant uh, and a bunch of visual effects that I knew I could do with my laptop. And so that script could have been made for $0. That was the, that was the truly freeing part of it. Now we didn't make it for $0. <laughs> right. we, ended up make, uh, we ended up making it for about a million dollars. But the way that that happened was as we had the script, um, we started showing it to people and, and slowly a friend would be like, oh, I'll give you 50 grand. And then an uncle was like, well, I'll give you a hundred grand. And oh, wow, now we're at 150 grand. We can make this movie for 150 because we can make it for zero. And then it was like, okay, well, maybe we don't have to act in it. <laughs> we actually have money now to pay some people. So then we got casting director and that led to getting some bigger actors, which led to getting some more money. And eventually it grew to a million. But the key was that every step, when we were at 500,000, when we were at 750,000, we could just say, cool, well, we can make the movie for this. So at no point were we giving the keys away to someone else. If someone said, well, I'll give you money, but only if you get Tom Cruise, only if you know you raise another 10 million or whatever it is, we, we didn't need to, to take that money. And so it allowed us to raise the money uh, with partners that were just excited to make the movie no matter what. And that's what actually led to the movie getting made no matter what, instead of not getting made. Um, and it was so freeing. And then, but then it was truly independent. It was like nine people put, wrote their checkbooks, were making a movie. Uh, we put that money to a bank account, made the movie. And then, uh, you know, we were lucky enough to get it into the Toronto Film Festival and then sell it for 2 million. So everyone, you know, doubled their money. That's awesome. And I say, I think that I'm glad that you're so transparent about that stuff. Cause that's what I love to bring to this process is, and something that I'm learning obviously as well too, is, you know, the, the, the business end of film is something I think a lot of creatives forget about. And, you know, you yeah. want to forget about it a lot of times you don't want to be yeah. like, Oh no, let's not think about that. But unfortunately it's, you know, it's a reality. We, we didn't want to produce it. You know, we, we tried to ask everyone we knew to, 
who was a producer to produce the movie, but anyone who's produced a $1 million movie never wants to produce a $1 million movie again because it's right. so hard. Um, but a lot of them said that they would happily, you know, answer our calls and mentor us. So we ended up having about five or six uh, producers that had made these types of movies before that were willing to have a phone call once a week. And because we had five or six of them, we could kind of call one a day <laughs> and then loop our way around again to the right, beginning. Yeah. Uh, and so Adam and I basically learned to produce that movie having never, you know, we produced shorts and we produced commercials and small stuff, but there's a lot of different things about a feature that you never had considered before. Um, especially on the sales side and, and all that type of stuff that we had no clue about. And we just met those uh, moments with curiosity and transparency. Whenever we would talk to someone and they'd say, hey, uh, you need a, you know, BX396 tax form or whatever, you'd be like, oh, great. What is that? And where do I get that? <laughs> and they would say, oh, well, you know, oh, okay. They're like, sorry, this is my first time. And then usually people would say, oh, no problem. You need to call this person and ask for this. Oh, okay. And how do I, who is that person? And then, you know, you call that person be like, hi, I've been told I need a BX93 or whatever, you know, it is. And you just kind of, we went through the whole process that way and, and it worked really well. Now, I guess I think because that's awesome to, to know because I, I think that's so great for people who are, are aspiring to be filmmakers and it's like, hey, you, you know, you don't have to know this. They feel like I think a lot of people think there's like, you know, it's like that what's the password kind of deal. And then if you don't know it, you, you're not in sort of thing. Yeah. Um, so it's nice to know that there are people out there like that. And and I assume a lot of learning came in the film festival aspect and, and submitting. And can you kind of talk about how you submitted to film festivals? Sure. Like what was that process like? Well, we did one thing that was kind of unique, which was to some degree, uh, which was that we, you know, we'd see a lot of friends and stuff announce their movies before they make them or while they're making them, like it, either get them in the trades or just post it on social media, basically announce that the movie exists before the movie's finished. And we just sort of, something in our bones said, I don't know if you really get a lot out of that. Like it, it feels good, like just have your and then announcement in Variety or something, and it, that when you cast a big actor, and it feels good to have people on Facebook going, "Way to go!" But we just said, "I think it might be better to wait and just save all of that, you know, momentum to the moment that we need it, where we need people to to do something." And so we basically were kept the movie completely off the internet all through the process of making it. No actors posted anything, nothing online. And when we finished the film, we started applying to film festivals. There's sort of a cycle to film festivals. It kind of starts with Sundance. Uh, you know, Sundance takes place sort of right at the beginning of the year, but the application are, applications are sort of in the fall. So we were editing around the fall. So we, we sent a rough cut to Sundance thinking, well, that, we probably won't get it in, but that's the first one. But we didn't get in. <laughs> and then we sent, you know, we, we started sending it to the, each next one. I think the next one was South by and, you know, Telluride and kind of worked our way up through the list. You know, we, th there's two different types of film festivals that we were very aware of. There's film festivals and then there's film festivals that have markets and markets mean buyers go there to buy movies. Um, and that, you know, our movie had no distributor, it had no pre-sales, it had nothing like that. So we needed to go to a market that had buyers. Um, and you might get offers of this happened to a friend of mine he finished his film and he got an offer to be in a, a, a smaller festival um, but it, it that didn't have a market right as soon as he finished it and he went into that that film festival so excited and he actually won best film of the festival which was great but there was no market at that film festival and so none of the other market film festivals would let him in and none of the other distributors were interested because it had already been exposed it, the film had already been exposed, basically. Right. So yeah, we tried to premiere. Yeah. So we tried to only apply to big festivals that people went to buy movies, and with the and we had the benefit of no one knew this movie exists. So every, every time it got rejected, we could just say that it was created a month ago, like, and we could do that all year until we came right back around to Sundance again, um, and then start at the B tier festivals if that if that happened. And we got rejected. We got rejected. We got rejected. And I started wondering if there's something more to this than just sending, sending it in blindly because it, it feels really powerless when you're doing that. I talked to a friend of mine that had been in the Toronto Film Festival the year before. And I said, you know, we're getting rejected like crazy. What, what's the secret? What did you do to get into TIFF? And he's like, oh, just talk to the programmers. Um, you know, he's like, here's the 
email of the Toronto programmer and uh, just let them know you have a film when you send it in, like make that personal connection, which had like never occurred to me. I always assumed festival programmers were these sort of dark lords that sit in a room, you know, silhouetted that just hate movies. And, you know, cause I'd just been rejected by them my whole life. So I just assumed they were, they were evil. And then I reached out to the programmer. He got back to me within 20 minutes. He was like, Oh my God, that sounds great. I'd love to watch it. Set up a, uh, sent the film to him. And two weeks later he called and was like, you're in, we love the film. We can't wait, you know? And it, it became a process, you know, over the, we got into TIFF, which was a pretty big festival. And from TIFF, we got invited to lots of other festivals. This was something that was new to me is that when you get into a certain festival, lots of programmers go to those festivals and then program for their festival. And then you kind of work your way down. So TIFF was our world premiere. From there, we got invited to Sitges, which was our European premiere. And from Sitges, we got invited to sort of the genre festival of every country in Europe. So, um, and these are all invitations. So we weren't having to pay the application fees or anything. It's just, they saw the movie and they said, hey, please come to France please come to Brussels, please come to Amsterdam. Um, and then from there, we would get, you know, invited to the, uh, the other three tiny festivals in France, you know, and you kind of, it keeps kind of branching down. And at all these festivals, meeting all of the programmers, realizing they love movies more than anyone because they're watching 500 feature films a year, you know, because they're, <laughs> they're consuming so many movies. They have, it's just that they, they have to, you know, they can't program everything, um, but they are people you can develop relationships with. And so at the festival at Toronto, when we were there, we took the programmer out for beers. You know, we got to know him. We hung out with him at the parties. We just became friends with the programmer, not in a fake way. We actually quite liked him. But knowing that now we have a relationship with the Toronto programmer and every film festival we went to, we did that. And usually the, the programmers want to hang out with the filmmakers. They they've invited you to their film festival and they want to get to know you. And that's a lifelong uh, relationship that can be really helpful. And even if you're a short filmmaker, you can do the same thing. If you have a short film that gets into a, a bigger film festival, go there and meet the feature programmers and hang out with them. And because they love programming the features of people that have had their shorts premiere at that festival. They love that story of like, oh, you came here with a short and now you're coming here with your first feature. And so developing a relationship with the programmers, I think is basically the key to getting into film festivals. Otherwise they just have so many movies, you just kind of get lost in the mix. Yeah, no, and that's incredible. I, and I never thought about that too. And I, and I think I'd heard once before somebody kind of mentioned it. And, and I guess like, what does that type of connection look like? Like, how are you trying to be as genuine as possible, but also, you know, say like, hey, this is my film. I mean, they're like, just you know, film nerds. It's just like every other film nerd that you've met. Like it's, it's just emailing them, geeking out about movies, hanging out with them when they're there. And it's, it's there's nothing awkward or hard about it. They're basically just the ultimate film nerds that, um, and they love your movie probably because that's why you're there um and you know film festivals are great not right now because of covid but it, yeah, they right. will again be it be about you know all film festivals have so many opportunities for networking and hanging out and partying and you know even if it's not big parties most even the smaller film festivals everyone goes to a certain bar every night you know and you could just get you meet all these other filmmakers you meet all these other programmers you meet programmers from other countries um and you just start to kind of grow this network uh that's that's there yeah. And, and then so obviously taking freaks there and obviously, you know, had this big run kind of, it, it, I feel like like a band on tour almost. Yeah, <laughs> uh -huh. it was, it was like a year. We went to 40 film festivals in a year. Wow. Awesome. And, and so, you know, when you're at these film festivals, what does the, 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 the getting, you know, obviously in this case, you had no distribution, but you end up selling it. What, what are those conversations? Are they people coming to you? Are you going to them? Sort of, how does that look like? Yeah. So the key um, there's sort of two keys to selling your movie at a film festival um, that I would really, really, really recommend having in place. Um, it's not just you are in the film festival completely alone, your movie premieres and everyone comes running in front. What, what, there's actually a machine behind it. And the two parts of that machine are your sales agent and um, your marketing team, your publicist. So a sales, both of these are things you put in place many, many months before the festival. So when we got into TIFF, we, um, we knew that this was gonna be our one opportunity to sell the movie. TIFF has a, is one of the biggest markets in the world. Um, plus it was a Canadian film and it's a Canadian festival. So we'd have a certain amount of you know spotlight there as well. Um, 
So we started getting introduced to sales agents and they basically, they're sort of like real estate agents. They represent you in the sale and they have a lot more relationships with all of the buyers. You know, they're, they're basically de- dealing with all of the buyers, the streamers, the distributors, uh, the, even the small distributors every day at every festival all year round. Like they just fly from festival to festival to festival every year. So they take 10% of whatever your film sells for, but they have all of the relationships and all of the knowledge and all of, and, and you want to uh, get them, you know, three months, four months before you get to the film festival, because there's a lot of other things that happen. Like, for example, they'll work with the programmers to make sure that your movie premieres on a good night. Cause you know, there's even right, times yeah. that you want a premiere or that you're at TIFF, they have something called a um, a press and industry screening, which is a screening just for the industry, not open to the public, making sure that's at a good time, that the industry is going to be there. Interesting, um, yeah. And, and uh, the bigger the sales agent, the more clout they have because they, they they represent more than one movie when they go to the film festival. So if they, you know, we ended up getting one of the best. We had the CAA. So, um, you know, they were representing like 20 movies at the film festival with a whole team. But that gave us sort of clout to to be able to get a good a good slot. We had a, a great slot for our movie. The other huge part of it is a, is a publicist, a marketing team. They're someone that you actually pay. Most, they're generally between, they're, I would say on average, they're about $10,000 to do a festival. So it's definitely considerable, but if you're, but if you're trying to sell your movie that you just spent a million on, you know, right, yeah, that reserve, <laughs> reserve, reserve 10,000 for a publicist. Yeah. Um, and they basically, um, try and do two things. One, they try and do screenings with press before the festival. Um, and so you're trying to basically, you know, we would do screenings in LA, screenings in New York, and we'd invite the press to it. Um, they're press screenings, so there's only press in the room. And whatever their opinion is, is, is embargoed until basically the night of the actual premiere. It's just like in those old movies where they have a, they do a play and they get the newspapers and they open right, it, yeah. see if they have a hit or not. And so, <laughs> you try and get as many of these uh, press people to, to review your movie because at the festival itself, they can only see so many movies and there's, and they, they, and then they have to write the reviews, but you want the reviews all to come out the moment your movie premieres so that the distributors feel like, Oh, wow, this movie's getting a lot of press and a, hopefully the reviews are positive. Right. Yeah. But if they are, they're, they're, they're all coming out at the moment your movie premiered in all the trades and all the different newspapers and, you know, and so distributors feel like, oh, they got to check this out if they, if they weren't there. Or they see, oh, this movie's doing well. I, I saw it last night and the press seems to like it. So it creates momentum there. The other thing that um, publicists do for you at the festival um, is get you lots of interviews and things at the festival itself. Um, so, you know, a lot of press are there and they set up sort of press days where you just interview a whole bunch of people at once. Um, and that stuff again is sort of just helping get the momentum going, you know, at the festival itself and helps with other festivals. Um, and, and then beyond that, you know, Adam and I, we just did a whole bunch of guerrilla marketing, like at the festival, we, we did all sorts of stuff we weren't allowed to do. Like we just, we, we stuck up it. posters, <laughs> like in all the places you're not allowed to stick posters up. You know, we were stick putting stickers on things. We were just like everywhere we could, we were putting postcards you know, on tables that we weren't allowed to put postcards on. We were just like blanketing the place with anything and everything we could, um, which our publicist was very nervous and basically didn't want to know anything about. Right. Um, like, <laughs> but we were like, I don't know. care. This is our one chance. Like, yeah. Oh, and, we, yeah. and we did it in a, we did it in a, in a fun way where like, cause our film freaks is sort of about, you know, persecution of people that are different. And we put up all these like sort of government looking posters that were like, report freaks they've been spotted in the area call this number if you see freaks which didn't even say anything about the movie but generally people know it's Toronto Film Festival it probably has to do about a movie in some way if you called the number it said we had a 1-800 number that we made that if you called it it said uh freaks have been reported in your area you know everyone's very concerned we're going to have a public meeting at the uh, Tinseltown number one theater at 7 p.m on Saturday you know, please come to the community meeting if you're concerned about freaks, which was basically our screening time. Um, That's and so, so uh, lots of people were Instagramming and taking photos and calling the number. And then, and then it, it would say, please leave a voicemail of your, of the freak that you report of that you saw. 
And then so lots of people were, were leaving these like hilarious, strange you know, voicemails. That's great. I love that. That's such like, a clever way, I feel like. And I don't think I love hearing stuff like that because it's such a such like a you can tell the passion behind it and i think that's always fun to see that obviously and i feel like people i mean you know distributors and, and whoever we met with a distributor he was like we were telling about the movie he goes and we told him about the poster he's like oh my god i saw that poster and he whipped out his phone he's like look it's the last thing i instagrammed and literally that he didn't even know it was our movie but he just thought it was a cool poster because we had a cool we hired like a a poster designer you know one of these sort of yeah, yeah. art house poster designers to do a, a very iconic looking poster um, and he just had Instagrammed it because he thought it was cool. So it did, you know, it, it's hard to say how much these things work, but at least that one, that one guy noticed. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, once that happens and obviously you create that buzz, actually selling the film, what type of, pro- and obviously I know you can't get in too much maybe, but like what type of process does that actually look like? Yeah. I mean, the, so they, they tell, they tell you, you know, the myth is that you're going to have this middle of the night bidding war and you know, you're going to shake hands in a hotel lobby at four in the morning. And you know, that, that doesn't happen. You usually take several weeks and we're like, okay. And then, you know, we got a call at 9 PM, like it's going down, get here, get to this hotel lobby right now. And we sold the movie at 4 AM um, in, with a handshake. Uh, the, but what happened in that scenario was, um, you know, hopefully you have multiple bidders, if not. Um, and basically your sales agent is sort of checking in with each of the distributors that have seen the film, seeing what they think. Uh, It might not happen right away. Um, Those different distributors are are making offers um, and the offers can kind of come into two camps. Um, There's basically, if you did what we did, which is we just raised money. There was no rights that had been sold on the movie whatsoever. Because sometimes you have to sell rights off to to make the movie. You have to get pre-sales, which means you sort of sell the movie for a certain territory ahead of time. Um, Or you might, if you're like a lot of Canadian movies need to have a Canadian distributor to get certain monies from the government. So you might've already sold Canada. In our case, we hadn't sold anything, which was part of our plan because the big streamers, they want what's called worldwide rights, which means that they wanna be able to buy the rights for the entire planet at once. and there's not a lot of distributors that want worldwide rights. It's basically just the streamers and some of the biggest studios like Universal or Sony. Um, but we had that available. And so they, we're talking to those types of people. But then you're also talking to um, international distributors, you know, a distributor from, uh, <laughs> from you know, Germany, a distributor from Japan that just want to buy Japan. And those numbers, those amounts are much smaller. They're like, you know, 50,000, 60,000 type of things rather than millions. Um, and so you're kind of keeping that in your mind. And what ended up happening with us is they, um, the company that bought it uh, didn't want to buy worldwide rights. They just wanted to buy North America and all English countries. Um, and so we had to do some math on like, okay, well, how much could have we sold those countries for, which our sales agents helped us with. We ended up selling it to them. Um, and then we had a bunch of other countries left over that they didn't buy, right? Basically all of the non-English speaking countries that are outside of North America. Um, and we had already had previous conversations with, with um, sales agents. It's different than the sales agent that, there's sort of two types of sales agents. There's the ones that are looking to do the domestic sale, which is sort of your big US sale that are there at the film festival with you. Um, and they're trying to get the worldwide sale. Uh, that was what CAA was doing. But we had another sales agent that we'd been talking to um, to do the international sales, which is selling off each of those tiny little countries, which is how most indie films make back their money. Most most producers, how they make their money. Um, And when you're doing these deals with international uh, sales agents, there's usually two types of deals you can do. One is, um, and it goes for selling to distributors as well. There's sort of two choices. One is getting money up front, and the other is owning a big piece of the money that comes down the line. So if you get the money up front, you basically get a check right now, whether anyone ever sees your movie again. But you basically either get no money or almost no money out of any future revenue. So you're kind of taking the money in in hand, um, which is what most people do, and I would recommend most people do. Yeah. (laughs) yeah, yeah. The the other way of doing it is you get... um, a low fee, meaning that there's no money up front, but any, any money that comes in, you get 90% of it and they get 10% of it, you know, um, after some fees and stuff. 
uh, but you're sort of rolling the dice, hoping right, that absolutely, they make yeah. th they make money on it. Um, and so we ended up doing in both cases with our distributor and our international sales agent, just taking money up front. And that's the money that added up to about, uh, about just over $2 million. But then we never yeah. saw any future money ever again. Um, yeah. But we knew that that doubled our investors profit. So, you know, and they were like our uncles and friends and things like that. So absolutely. Yeah. That, that was well worth it, you know, to know that. For sure. Now, I guess to kind of switch gears a little bit. So you've worked obviously with, you know, doing Freak, so this lower budget type film. And then you also worked doing some, again, I don't know here, but I feel like doing stuff for, for Disney would be a lot yeah, different is, workflow yeah. and sort of. So I would love to just know, like, what is, what is the difference between working on something low budget like that and then doing something for Disney where I'm assuming there's a lot more control? Yeah. So the differences, like you said, are, um, way, way less creative control. I mean, you still have, depending on, on what it is, a TV show, you, you have sort of less creative control than you do on a, on a movie. Like on a movie, you're still sort of the author, but you are, you have many masters that you're serving and every decision is overseen by lots of people. So you still have a lot more oversight and way less creative control, um, but you have a lot more money to play with. Um, I would say there's also um, the thing that surprised us you know, we went from doing Freaks, which was 1 million to Kim Possible, which I probably can't say the budget, but many, many, many more millions uh, than that. Um, yeah, I, I, and, I assumed, I was going to say, I didn't know how much, but I was like, I can assume, yeah. Um, and the, the main difference is like, you go from having, like on Freaks, we had a crew, we had some grips that had never seen a C-stand before. Like, you know, you're, you're basically, it's like it, everyone's there for the love and passion of it people are quitting every day because they're getting better deal. You know, you just, you're barely putting it together on the, on the crew side of things. And you're always just like, you know, painting the walls yourself and all that stuff. Um, but it's very fun and very freeing. And there's not a lot of, there, you know, everyone's in it for the right reasons. Uh, on the bigger stuff, you have the best crews. Like we, you know, on Kim Possible, we have the, the props guy that did Star Trek. You know, so it was like, you know, That's we incredible. had like the, you know, building jetpacks and things like you would only ever dream. You're like, oh, what if the jetpack had this, this, and this? And the next day he's like, here's your jetpack. Um, so crazy. like, you know, having the best, best crew that you don't really have to worry about and having all the gear and things that you don't have to really worry about. Like, you know, the decisions you're making is how many days are we going to have a techno crane? Okay, I guess we can go with three instead of four. Um, so like <laughs> those, those types of decisions are, are less stressful, but it is just as stressful as making an indie film for a completely different reason, which is like you were mentioning, the bigger the budget, the more uh, politics and stress there is, the more that all of the executives, all of the producers, all of the people in charge um, are stressed out and worried and, and second guessing things. And there's just so much more sort of, and that's something you get better and better at as you direct more and more is like dealing with the people side of it. Like the, the bigger budgets you get into the actual physical making of it, the shooting of it, the, the gear, the working with actors, all that sort of becomes very simple and sort of you get used to doing it. But the, the skills you're learning are all about people skills. It's all about politics. It's all about how do I get this idea through these 10 people that are terrified? You know, how do I convince the studio that what they're asking me to do is terrible, even though you know, they're my boss and, and I want to get employed again. You know, and all of those are the type of skills that you learn and you have to deal with. And luckily I co-direct, so it's really great to have, um, you know, a best friend to basically be like, okay, you know, everyone around us, you know, is nervous and doesn't think we can pull this off. How do we convince them that we can't? Um, you know, how do we, how do we uh, increase morale? How do we give them confidence? How do we, um, convince them that we know how to do this cheaper than they think it's going to cost, you know, all those types of things. Yeah. So, I mean, how does that like indie kind of mindset, I mean, does that still move over to, cause I feel like it could be plus or minus, you could bring it over and it could be like, you know, uh Oh, I'm, I'm too, you know, <laughs> low budget thinking on this, or maybe the opposite where it's like, wow, that low budget mentality came into real handy somewhere. The low budget mentality always comes in handy, but everyone thinks that it's so as a filmmaker, it's essential. And it, no matter how much money you have, you always come down to that moment where there's 30 minutes left and you've got to shoot three shots and you know you just got to go and, and 
put it together in a, in a you know, or the, the big expensive thing that was supposed to arrive three hours ago is stuck on the freeway and you've got to make it up on the spot. You know, all of those things you learn when you're being an indie filmmaker come into play and are a huge asset. The problem is everyone else thinks of indie filmmakers and indie filmmakers knowledge as a detriment. They think, oh, well, you don't know how to spend money. Oh, well, you don't know how to um, do things in the real leagues. You don't really know how to, to play with a hundred extras. You don't really know how to use a techno crane. You don't really know like how to look at a million dollar visual effects budget, which of course you do. It's not like, it's the exact same thing. It's just bigger, but they don't think that you do. So the problem is that it is a huge asset to your skill set, and it makes you a better director. It's just everyone else actually looks down at it. And so you have to kind of work doubly hard to show that you can do these things. And pretty quickly over time, they start to realize, oh, wow, actually he saved our ass there or she saved our ass there because, um, you know, they were able to move quickly. They didn't need to spend three hours to do one lighting setup. Um, you know, all those types of things end up being really helpful to you, but people look down at you um, for not having, you know, it, it's weird. Like it's, it's easier to make things with more money. It's harder to make things with less money. So if it would, if I was a producer and I had someone that had only ever made movies for $20 million and I was asking them to do it for a million, that's somewhere where I'd be worried about the director's experience, but they think of it the other way around. If you're doing a $20 million movie, and you've only done a $1 million movie, they think, oh, well, you don't know how to spend $20 million, which believe me, it's easy. Right. Yeah, it's yeah. easy to spend money. I was going to say, yeah, it just flies out the, flies out the door <laughs> there. And I feel like, are there any things in particular you can think of like times, whether it was on Freaks or whether it was on, you know, Kid Possible or, or any of the stuff you've done where there was a decision where, you know, because I think a lot of younger filmmakers, because we do have a lot of younger and newer filmmakers that listen, they may not even understand like what is a really difficult decision to make on set? You know, is there a some a situation that came up where you're like, wow, I would have never thought of this until I was here on set and it's happening? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's always you know, hopefully it's all done in prep. So like the better you you prep things, the less likely things are, are going to go haywire and go wrong on set. It's always has to do with time. It always has to do with running out of time. You always run out of time every day. So the, you get better and better at, at sort of making decisions that don't put you in a position where you're running out of time on stuff that's really, really important. Um, you know, so doing things like scheduling your most important stuff at the beginning of the day scheduling your hardest stuff at the beginning of the day and, and, and slowly working your way through it so that at the end of the day, all you're doing is inserts and like the shots of someone walking down a hall into a room and like the simplest, simplest, simplest stuff is what you're doing in the last hour so that that stuff can be rushed. You know, an insert that you shoot at the beginning of the day can take 45 minutes. An insert you shoot at the end of the day can take five minutes. It's the exact same shot. It's just, if it's at the beginning of the day, it takes 10 <laughs> times longer than if it's at the end of the day. So Everyone's just, just like move them all. lazy about it. Yeah, it's true. So just move all of those inserts to the end of the day. Um, but as far as something like um, that I was sort of surprised by and learned, learned by, I mean, really the first film that I did, which was a, a low budget sci-fi channel monster movie, you know, one of these cheesy B movies where a bunch of people get eaten every 10 minutes. Um, everything imaginable went wrong on that shoot. We had two force majeures which is unheard of. Most film, most filmmakers only have a one in their career. We had two in one movie. Um, you know, we had every day some major disaster. Um, to the, but, and at the time, I just thought this is what movie making was because it was my first movie. I just assumed that was normal. Um, but I later realized that it was a huge asset to go through that because I learned a lot of things to deal with that un, un, unpredictability. You've got this great plan, you show up, and then, um, you know, things go wrong that you can't, uh, you can't, you could have never foreseen dealing with. And what that started to train me to do, because it would happen every day, which usually doesn't happen. Usually that doesn't happen on a normal movie, but on that movie, right. yeah. um, I would just have my plan for the day and a plan of things I'll do when something goes horribly wrong. So like, I always had like, this is really simple and we didn't get it yesterday or we didn't, you know, we need these inserts for this montage or whatever it is. And I started just, we just had this list of the oh shit list of the stuff we would do so, you know, today is about shooting the scene with this truck. Okay, get the, bring in the truck and it gets stuck in, the, in like six feet of mud. That, you know, okay, well, now it's going to take them an hour to dig this truck out of the mud and we can't shoot anything without it. Oh, well, we have the oh shit list. Let's go 
while they're digging it out of the mud, we're going to go do this. And, and everyone would know and have been prepped that this is sort of at the bottom of the call sheet. Like this might happen. It's not planned, but <laughs> if something goes wrong, we're going to, we're going to do this. And every day we I would go that. do that while something went wrong. And that's, I've never had to pull that out that often again, but it's definitely a great mentality because instead of you having your plan and then freaking out that your plan isn't happening, it's, I have a plan for when the plan fails and that, and that's really satisfying to kind of pull your backup plan trigger. Oh, that's awesome. I think that's such a good idea too. Cause I feel like the, 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 anytime I ever assume something's going to go right, it never does. And then when I assume it's going to go wrong, it always does. So maybe if I just assume everything goes wrong. Yeah. I I do the same thing in my shot. I, I, I mark all the shots in my shot list that are things I'd love to get, but I don't absolutely need to have so that as things are going wrong, I can be moving those shots, you know, later in the day or just skipping them entirely um, without having to give too much thought to it. Cause I've already gone through and said, I have to have this. I, I really want this, but I don't need it. Well, I'm glad you brought up shot listing too, because that was going to be my last thing to talk about. Obviously <laughs> I've talked about you know, the shot list wrap a million times and obviously I'm a big fan. So I think, um, you know, what made you like, what, what kind of brought that just about in general? It was that movie. I was just talking about the sci-fi monster the movie um it was my first time making a you know a feature length thing i had made a bunch of shorts um and really it was just the first thing was a realization of like okay in a short film you know maybe you've got 30 40 shots um and i was like i was starting to shot list the movie and i was like wait a minute like i did some quick math i'm like i'm looking at like a thousand to fifteen hundred shots in this thing like i'm not gonna be able to put that in excel <laughs> like because at the time like the state of the art for was you put it in Excel and you print it out on a piece of paper and you hold that yeah. piece of paper on, on set. And then you sort of cross things off or scribble in the margins, like doing the math of like how much time you have left in the margins. And it was right around the, it was the same year that the iPad had just been released. Um, and I was like, okay, well, it'd be, I need a better way for managing this stuff. Um, and I, I actually found a, a program called FileMaker, which is sort of a fancy version of, of Excel. Um, and built basically a prototype of what shot lister was just for personally, just to kind of manage, you know, grouping shots by scene and, and then putting those shots into a shoot day so that I could see, okay, we're gonna do this shot, then we're gonna do this shot, then we're gonna do this shot. Sort of like a one-liner like you'd have for scenes, but with shots. And then I realized, oh, I can actually put how long I think each of these is gonna take. And then I realized, well, actually the iPad knows what time it is. So it can figure out based on what time it is and how much shots are left if I'm ahead or behind. And I basically, FileMaker at the time had a prototype, uh, had an iPad app so you could load your FileMaker file on an iPad and it was really clunky, Um, but it worked. And when I was on set, you know, everyone was like, wow, that's amazing. Uh, You know, you should sell that. And, And at the time I was sleeping on my mom's floor when I was making that movie and she used to be a TV producer and she looked at it and she's like, well, that's amazing. You should make that as an app too. She immediately saw like the value of it. And I was like, well, I don't know how to program and I don't have the money to pay someone to program. And she was like, well, I have money. <laughs> so she, she, she and I went into business together. Um, and, you know, she paid for that initial sort of creation of the 1.0 version, which was many years ago. It was like iOS five or something um and and uh and we just sort of built this early early version and um we you know it was brand new at the time so we we made back my mom's investment like in a month um and then we've just sort of had steady sales i mean it's it's something that we we basically put like 90 percent of money that the app makes just into keeping it going it's not it doesn't have you know, we've got lots and lots of awesome filmmakers around the world, probably tens of thousands of them that use the app. Um, but it's still a pretty niche thing. Uh, and so it's really just a passion project that we have, but it's grown into being an incredibly powerful um, app where we now have um, all sorts of uh, huge shows that are using it. You know, lots of Netflix shows are now using it. Um, and, uh, it allows you to really do some incredible things, which is, I find, you know, we, we hear from lots of filmmakers that once they use it, they don't know how they could ever go 
go back to not using it because it's a totally it's Absolutely, a new way of, yeah. of think of, of thinking like once you have your shoot day as a fluid thing that you because it is a fluid thing once set it, it's not something that a piece of paper can really do justice that you can move around and you can adjust your your estimates you can combine shots you can add new shots you can and you get a picture of how you're doing you can do exactly what i was talking about earlier you can as things are changing you can move the, the stuff that you don't need to later in the day you can change how much that stuff's going to take and you can share that stuff with your whole crew digitally um, it just really creates sort of this much better presence of mind where you have a much better grasp on what what you've done and what is left to do and it helps you prioritize that rather than it just sort of being a guess and a vague feeling of time is going by um, you actually know exactly like okay we have an hour and 46 minutes and we're going to do this shot for half an hour, this shot for 20 minutes, this shot for five minutes. And the cool thing is when you're done a shoot day, if you've been clicking off those shots at the moment you finish them, you actually have a record long each shot took, which can really help you um, go back and sort of get a better sense of estimating how long shots are going to take. Because every set works at a different pace. And you can start to see those patterns like, oh, okay, a shot right after lunch takes an hour uh, and a shot, but the next shot takes 45 minutes. And the next talk shot takes half an hour. Like you kind of see those flows that people are slow after lunch that at the beginning of the day, it always takes an hour before we shoot anything. So you can start to build in those rhythms into your planning, which really helps. Yeah. That's clever. I didn't even think about that. Being able to kind of look back and reflect and, and see that. That's, that's yeah. awesome. I, well, I really appreciate you taking all the time and answering all my questions here. I mean, it was uh, for sure. I think it's going to be really awesome information for everybody. So I'm very excited. So, and we just released a new version that has episodes uh, built into Shotlister now. So you can um, uh, create for all the people that are doing TV shows or, or web series or anything like that, um, or even, you know, just anything that has multiple episodes that you want to shoot on the same day. Uh, we now have that ability, which uh, has been our most requested feature. So it's been really excited, exciting to get that out to the world. Awesome. Well, thank you again for, you know, jumping on the podcast here. I really appreciate that. Thank you for sure. Time. I've uh, been glad to talk to you and you learned a ton. So it's exciting. Sure. We are film, but we are film podcast is brought to you by the black mountain visuals podcast network.